progressing the consideration of populations and specific subpopulations and the return of results debate, which we kind of nicknamed the context panel, um, because really the populations we're talking about here refer to both, you know, you know race and ethnicity is a type of population, but also patient populations, disease populations, or in the case of, you know, Dr. Henderson, non-disease populations, healthy populations. So, you know, we're really hoping to get into some of the issues that already started coming up in this morning's conversation about what you do when you take these return of results recommendations to a specific context in which your patients arrive. All right, so I'll do the introductions, all of them right now, so that we don't have to interrupt any of the talks. Uh, we already had a nice introduction to Dr. Uh, Carmen Rudecki Breitkopf this morning, and you already saw some of her work, so she'll be presenting today as well. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Nanima Garrison, who is um, an assistant professor in the departments of pediatrics and anthropology, and a faculty member in the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society at the Vanderbilt University. <laughs> Medical Center, and her research you know, interests include genetic research in Native American communities, informed consent, and issues involving privacy and confidentiality. Uh, then we'll hear from Dr. Sharon Pon, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Molecular and Human Genetics, and the director of the Cancer Genetics Clinical Program and Cancer Genetics Research Program at Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, her research encompasses, encompasses both translational and clinical topics, and um, one of the big projects that she's working on and will be presenting part of today is uh, one of the clinical sequencing exploratory research programs, which she is an investigator with Dr. Will Parsons, um, one of the projects which we at NCI happily co-fund. And last but not least is Dr. Gail Henderson, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Social Med Medicine and also uh, an adjunct professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, her teacher, her uh, teaching and research interests include global health inequality and research ethics. Uh, Professor Henderson is a medical sociologist with training in public health and you know, experience in interdisciplinary research and analysis. And she is also affiliated with one of the clinical sequencing exploratory research programs. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, gene, gene screen, so yes. Uh, <laughs> Um, and the Center for Genomics and Society at UNC. You'll be hearing more about her program as well. So uh, I think we're running short on time. So we'll, without further ado, we'll start with Dr. Breik. Um Well, when we think about um, addressing diversity among families, that could be any number of aspects of diversity. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to focus on, as well as our next speaker, is um, what we know about race and ethnicity in the context of genetic research and how that's in, uh, really intertwined with issues related to cultural and social diversity. The issue of return to family is only relevant to those who participate in genetic research. It seems like an obvious statement, but what we know from the literature is that in a 2009 review of nearly 400 studies worldwide, more than 90% of those studies included only people of European descent. As we continue to use the samples uh, from these studies in um, future research, we're going to perpetuate this lack of diversity in our research findings. However, I think as worldwide collaborations um, begin and strategies to enroll more diverse populations in genetic research are examined and applied, that this is going to change. I hope it's going to change. In looking at participation in genetic research studies, we know that minorities have lower acceptance of genetic research than whites or European Americans. However, we also know that when we control for the issue of trust, these differences go away. Among those who do participate, the reasons for participation do not seem to differ by race and ethnicity, and the reasons people participate are generally through altruistic no, uh, notions or personal or collective health benefit of participation. Finally, um, minorities appear to want uh, individual research results for the same primary reasons as non-minorities. So we're going to the reasons of personal utility, so disease prevention and preparation. Although what I'm going to see, what we're going to talk about is the nuances that will surround um, how we can think about returning um, these, these results. So what I'd like to do is review the few studies that have um, looked at minority perspectives, minority participant perspectives, 
Um, this research has largely been qualitative studies. Um, focus group methodology has been used, and that's appropriate for this stage in the research, appropriate for early stage and really soliciting the baseline levels of what can be learned. In a study that examined reasons for participating in the Mount Sinai Biobank, so these are all participants in this biobank, they looked at African American and Hispanic participants in particular. There were six focus groups in this study for a total of 43 individuals, a majority female, 49% Hispanic, and 46% African American. In this study, the majority expressed an interest in receiving personal genetic results. We see that theme, people want to know their results who are participating. No participants in this study mentioned this double-edged sword that has been seen in earlier studies involving minority participants. So the idea that while genetic testing on the one hand can lead to um, prevention of disease and greater knowledge of what might be coming for someone, uh, it also could be used uh, this information could be used unethically, it could cause anxiety, or it could even provide false reassurance. The second study involved a community sample in Orange County, California. Um, this study focused on maternal perspectives on return of results for their children. Seven focus groups, now we have 50 participants, all of them female, 28% Hispanic, 21% Asian. In this study, what was learned is that there was a general expectation of a more personal approach to returning genetic results. Uh, this approach, more personal, was defined as more dynamic and more flexible, so rather than web-based access to genetic results as a research participant. Latinas, in particular, expected interventions. Um, they expected education if they were going to learn their research results. They expected personal guidance for follow-up and risk-reducing steps that they could take with their children who might have identified disorders. Two papers by you and colleagues were, um, Dr. Burke mentioned these this morning in her keynote address, but I'll just um, summarize a few nuances to the study that, that she didn't have time to, to go over. So this was a community sample of African American and non-African American residents of Seattle King County, Washington. 13 focus groups, 76 individuals, 54% African American, again a majority were female. We see the same pattern, majority of these community members would want to receive their whole genome sequencing results. And this was um, presented to them as a hypothetical study that would involve parents and children. And they were asked what they would want to receive, why, and how they would want to receive that information. We see there were slight differences. So the African Americans were a little bit less likely to want to know the results than the non-African American group. And what's really interesting in the study is the differences in perspectives between the focus groups of African American and non-African American participants. These examples um, of the differences are outlined here. So concerns about whole genome sequencing results related to insurance and privacy. So um, the non-African Americans were concerned about health and long-term care insurance, whereas the African Americans were concerned about access to health care and their ability to follow up on what's called an actionable finding. Providers uh, were expected in the non-African American group to be involved in the return of results. The African American uh, focus groups did not particularly want providers to be involved. Um, they expressed a distrust of them and they didn't necessarily want the providers involved. They wanted to review the results themselves independently. The African American group was more focused on the psychosocial impact of potentially receiving bad news, um, whereas the non-African American group were more focused on future health behaviors and the things that they could change as a result of learning this genetic information um, about themselves. What was interesting about that is the African American group said, um, and there's a quote in here, that we want to hear the good news as well as the bad news. So for instance, if our child is going to grow up to be a, a genius or a musician, we want to know that too. Um, so those kinds of nuances came up in those focus groups. With regard to individual versus community benefit, the non-African American sample were interested um, in 
individual knowledge about their health and um, contributing generalizable knowledge in the research area, whereas the African Americans focused on community and societal benefit in issues regarding racial justice. African American uh, participants in this research envisioned sharing genetic results with the community and getting a communal interpretation of the meaning through their social groups. And those were often churches and faith-oriented groups. God was mentioned in every focus group with, conducted with the African American participants. The non-African American participants envisioned sharing results with doctors and immediate family. And the last paper that I'd like to review um, was again community participants, 10 focus groups, and we've now reached a whopping 100 subjects. Okay, we're really, the, there is so little out there. Um, again, majority were female, 76% African Americans. Um, this study examined public attitudes toward return of results that focused on African Americans. The study used vignettes that highlighted different options for returning results, so a summary report, no results at all, your own results through a genetic counselor. And it often it also examined different data sharing practices. So other scientists that were studying the same disease might have access to your sample. The disease was diabetes, which is highly relevant to African Americans. Just any researcher could re use your sample, or only the study investigator could use your sample. And again, they just looked at um, viewpoints on how these um, would be received. So having the option to receive individual results was viewed favorably, and it was viewed as more desirable than a summary report or not getting any results at all. There was no consensus on entitlement in this study, so people expected exactly what was written in the consent form, and transparency was all that was required. Participants were distrustful and resentful of a paternalistic approach of researchers. They felt it was outside of the researcher's purview to decide what was clinically actionable. That was not their expertise, and it was really the role of clinicians to make those determinations. And as, um, as seen in other studies with African American participants, providing the option to learn results can enhance trust and show respect. And that trust, as I said, is a very key difference in whether or not minorities will participate in research. Researchers have done a lot to undermine that trust. We need to do a lot more to build that trust back. So the, the key points across these studies um, that, and I want to recognize a number of caveats here, that there's much heterogeneity. I'm talking about African Americans, Hispanics. We know there's a lot of heterogeneity within these racial and ethnic groups. So I do not at all mean to imply that we lump everyone together. For the sake of looking across these articles, minority participants in genetic studies and community samples um, that they're thinking about hypothetical studies or being in studies, these individuals want results. And I said at the beginning that return of family is only relevant if, these, if we get people to participate in genetic studies. So the issues that we're talking about all day today and that I'll be talking about again all day tomorrow are very relevant with return to family. Perspectives on sharing beyond the individual to family members and to the broader community are likely to differ among minorities and all of those nuances that I talked about. We know very little about this. Expectations surrounding learning results and what to do with that information may differ in minorities and partic be particularly interested, I'm sorry, influenced by trust in medicine and research. And as, as I implied, we have the opportunity to build trust as we shape policy. So in this last section, I'd just like to focus on things that we need to consider that are conflated with race and ethnicity as we build and suggest policy around return of results to family. Uh, a number of psychological constructs come to mind. Perceived personal control over the who, how, and when family members learn results. How learning a particular result will potentially change a family's identity or an individual's concept of themselves as a member of that family. Different cultures have different spiritual and faith traditions, um, including the role of God in the gene pool. And so we need to acknowledge, and these really have not been addressed in the literature thus far. Also, cognitive and emotional perspectives will be heavy, heavily contextualized. They'll, they will differ across diverse groups, including how a threat like a genetic 
predisposition for a disease would affect families and how they might choose to cope with that threat. Social constructs of interest, um, stigma is a socially defined construct as to what and what is not stigmatizing will vary for different groups. Similarly, cultural taboos will vary, and we need to go into these different populations and learn what those might be. Diverse family structures, gender roles, communication and language are also contextual factors that need to be considered. We need to recognize um, that there will be differences in who is the decision maker in families, who is to be protected from bad news. So in some cultures that's children, and in other cultures that's elders, and in many cultures we don't even know. Um, so we need to be thinking about those things. Also temporal orientation, so cultures vary on whether they're present focused or future focused, and for genetics that certainly seems important. Finally, cultural beliefs about health and illness are extremely important considerations if we're going to accommodate diversity in policy and return to families. Um, a paper by Schultz on the Human Genome Project showed that African Americans and Hispanic concerns about genetic risk went beyond discrimination of individuals and even families and extended to concern that a particular genetic risk or condition would become associated with their entire racial ethnic group, which in turn would lead to discrimination and future health inequities. And all of these um, psychological and social construct, constructs will be influenced in many ways by race, ethnicity, sex, and gender. Additional considerations include the importance of cultural competence training for researchers. If researchers are going to be returning results to individuals or family members, what preparation do they have for doing that? And so these are things we need to consider. Increasing diversity within the field. There's a lack of representation of minorities in key roles in the field of genetics, including PIs, genetic counselors, and policymakers. In the U.S., an important consideration is immigrant status and political climate for racial and ethnic minorities that may be asked to give their samples and have them contained within a biobank. There's a great potential for suspicion regarding what's going to happen to those samples and the purpose of, of collecting them and what they will be used for. This suspicion um, and these beliefs might affect how we recruit minorities into our biobanks. So thinking about a community recruitment approach versus a clinic-based recruitment approach might be important. And finally, we, we need to consider return to family members that might be in other countries. And my time is up. So I, <laughs> um, I will leave you with that thought about other countries. And my last slide is... Uh, the fact, the obvious fact. Policy is moving faster than science, and we need more data. I've outlined these studies. The biggest one was 100 participants in a focus group. That's nothing to base policy on. Um, future studies that include return to families should consider all of those constructs and more um, with regard to outcomes of returning results. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Breikoff, for basically framing my discussion. And I'm very delighted to go right after because what I'll be talking about today are some of the considerations when thinking about family members and also people of, di of diverse backgrounds. And um, I have no conflicts of interest, and I also have no answers for how to, how to go about doing this. But what I hope to do is to start a conversation and uh, to, to help you to start thinking about what some of these issues might be or what some of the considerations of uh, diverse family members would be. So I'm going to talk about three major things and I'm going to go through kind of quickly because I, my slides have a lot of text but I hope that the text will, um, will provide discussion materials for later and you can take a look at my slides later and, and take these back to your, your own communities and think about them. But I'll talk about family structures in various cultures, some cultural differences around addressing death, and some considerations with returning results to some of these families. So um, minority families are, can be very large extended families, and I'm, I'm also um, just very broadly generalizing on what I say does not apply to all different families, but many family members act as units. They might act together, and they might uh, interact with each other in a way that it might be a little bit different from a, a general American family. And, in some minority communities, autonomy is not viewed the same way as, um, or it, autonomy might not be as important to some of these diverse families. 
and uh, the, the issue of autonomy might not really apply to some of these families where they really want to engage uh, the elders in their community or the matriarchs or the patriarchs of their family uh, structure. Uh, they might default to those uh, matriarchs or patriarchs, the eldest uh, people within their families to make medical decisions or make other large um, decisions about their family well-being or uh, financial tra transactions or so forth. Uh, and so also so in some families, uh, medical decisions are uh, default to those with the most medical knowledge or the most knowledge about um, the legal system or whatever the issue may, may be. And so we really need to consider these family structures when thinking about genomic information because these uh, genomic information can carry impact further than just first degree relatives as we already know. But the way that that is communicated within large family networks might, uh, might not carry the same weight as it might in a smaller family unit where you only have uh, two parents and uh, two siblings and you know, not a very large um, extended family involved. There's also many different views of families, and so in some minority communities and uh, in some cultures, cousins are viewed as brothers and sisters, and so there's no um, distinction between who, who might be a cousin and who might be a brother. Um, and so that might, that might be something to keep in mind. And uh, whether a person is a brother or a sister compare, as opposed to a cousin might also depend on whether it's a matrilineal or patrilineal society. In other cultures, uh, men make all the decisions. And so understanding the different cultural um, dynamics might be very important to, to, to determine who to talk to um, and thinking about who the family is. And who is a part of the family unit? It might vary quite a bit. Uh, so when, when, when engaging families and trying to decide who to convey information to, it's very important to think about who the participant or the patient is, but who who else is involved in helping, helping to make those uh, decisions? And what if, what if an extended large family uh, comes into your office and, and they all want to be an equal stakeholder? How do you decide which person uh, to, to communicate with the most? And how does HIPAA apply? Um, I have, I'm not going to go into HIPAA, but I know that a lot of uh, discussions have been focused on that. And so I'm just going to show, uh, just sharing a, a short passage in the book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, where uh, the physicians who had been involved in the care of a Hmong child walked into a hospital, and you can kind of see that there's a lot of um, complexity here. Decisions about procedures, such as surgery, that violated Hmong taboos often took hours. Wives had to ask their husbands, husbands had, had to ask their elder brothers, elder brothers had to ask their clan leaders, and sometimes the clan leaders had to telephone even more important leaders in other states. And so where, where do you draw the line? How many people must be involved in making these major decisions? And, um, I, and also, I'm, I also want to share uh, some, some more specific examples. Uh, for, for example, a matrilineal family, uh, w which the Navajo tribe is, a, is a, viewed as a matrilineal type of family, um, where in the Navajo tribe there's, there's a clan system and that is inherited through the maternal line and the matriarchs are the main people who make uh, decisions. And uh, for a, just to give you a quick story, uh, when, when a Navajo couple gets divorced, the woman owns the property, she throws out the husband's um, belongings and she is the one who dictates you know, whether it's time for him to leave or not. And she's the main person who makes the decisions for her family and when she has questions she goes to her mother and they make decisions together. But a lot of, that, a lot of those cultural norms are changing as more and more people are becoming assimilated into American cultures and these different laws about ownership are challenging the way that people viewed uh, property and ownership previously. And so the, the matriarch of the family might be the one who makes decisions, but that might be changing also. Uh, the, in, in some societies, like the Navajo society, uh, matriarchs also make decisions about dealing with the dead and funerary um, uh, obligations where, the, where people get buried, buried and so forth. And all of that is being challenged by um, American society, by religion, uh, different uh, Christianity. All of that is challenging what, what people used to do um, another example from a more patrilineal uh, example is uh, in, in some cultures, including Korean cultures, the import importance is really placed on the eldest son. Uh, so when the eldest son's father dies, the mother comes and lives with the son, and the son is the one who dictates what goes on. And a lot of the, um, 
the importance or a lot of the um, ideas about what, what must happen within the family is, um, is placed on the son. But uh, Koreans are, um, by and large, immigrant populations uh, who came to the U.S. at different times. And so, as uh, D Dr. Breikoff mentioned earlier, we really have to think about what these um, immigrant populations think as well as uh, different generations might have different viewpoints on, on how to uh, deal with family, family issues. So moving, over, moving on to uh, end-of-life conversations, and uh, in some cultures, talking about end-of-life is a huge cultural taboo. Uh, it's a taboo to plan for the unknown. For example, in some cultures, it's even um, a taboo to think about birth and to plan ahead for birth. Uh, in fact, some, some cultures will refuse to have baby showers before birth because they want to make sure that the baby is born healthy and then they can celebrate. But if you, put it, if you have a baby shower before that, that might complicate the birth. And so just thinking about the, the many different ways about approaching life and approaching uh, end of life uh, might vary from culture to culture. Uh, some cultures also believe that it's a taboo to talk about death. And if you talk about death, that's wishing, uh, wishing that upon yourself or wishing other bad things upon yourself. And as I, as I talk about all of this, I realize that I myself uh, and breaking some cultural norms from my own background um, because these are things that, that um, you just don't talk about. Uh, so taken from uh, another short excerpt in The Scalpel and Silver Bear, which is by Lori Arviso Elbord, a Navajo surgeon who, um, was re very, who returned back to the Navajo uh, reservation to practice, said, Navajos are so uncomfortable t with death and dying. Uh, the discomfort arises partly because the Navajo belief in the power of language, the belief that you can speak something into existence. Such verbalizing would be seen as asking for it to happen, and so you just don't talk about it, um, and you have to respect that. But how do you talk about return of results when, when uh, a person, when, when, when you know that death is inevitable and you want to be able to return those results to people, how do you approach the topic of death? I mean, we can't even talk about return of results if we can't even talk about death in, in this context, but there might be um, I, uh, culturally appropriate ways to think about this. Uh, so another example um, I have is a family member who went in for a surgery, uh, was presented with the standard advanced directive forms. Um, and she actually declined to fill it out because she, she feared that filling out an advanced directive would bring bad luck during the surgery. And so even something as benign as this where we think, you know, it, this is standard procedure, um, it's a good thing to have documentation about, um, about family members and who should be making decisions. Just talking about it was um, seen as a taboo. And so how do these conversations happen or not happen? How do you um, initiate the conversation? Um, I, I don't really have the answers, but I have a couple of ideas about what we can think about. Um, also, dealing with, uh, dealing with, with death, uh, so in some cultures, uh, they, people destroy all of the personal belongings that belong to the person um, upon death. And um, for example, there, there are examples of people from different cultures, cultures who would give away a lot of prized possessions before death because they were aging and they knew that it was inevitable. Um, otherwise, it would have to be burned or buried and nobody could have those materials. So um, if you were to keep anything, you would have to have an, a ceremony to accompany, accompany that. But um, maybe somebody else who has more expertise in the room than me might have an idea about how financial transactions are dealt with or medical records, uh, clinical research findings. There's, there's, as far as I know, no guidelines on how to handle those inf that information. In some cultures, it's also uh, traditionally, um, in some cultures, the widow is um, forbidden to engage in dealings with their deceased one for some period of time. For some people, it might be four days or two days. Some might be a month. Uh, in some cultures, it might be up to a whole year. So uh, just keeping those in mind when, you, when dealing with um, different people from different cultures um, would be pretty important. So some considerations um, are thinking about the family. What are the family dynamics? Are they holding on to some of these traditional customs? Are they more assimilated into American practice? Have they adopted a different religion? Uh, each family is different, and even when you think about people within the same cultural, with the same cultural background, they might have very different approaches to thinking about these issues. Uh, so who is the decision maker to, get, to engage with um, 
there could that could be a number of different people. And another thing that I think has been has been discussed a little bit, um, but I, I want to reiterate here, our research results could be conflated with clinical or, or medical results. And so if you're thinking about returning results after death, the family members might wonder why they, this information was not included in, in medical reports or autopsy reports. And so why is somebody contacting them several weeks or months later with new information that they did not um, actively request? And so that's another consideration. So how do we get consent about sharing after death if the topic is not even mentioned, uh, not even allowable, you can't even mention it. Uh, and so I, I think there's, there's some recommendations around how to frame this, and I, these are just my personal ideas. I don't really know, I don't have answers for this exactly. But I think one could avoid framing it um, as if you could not make this decision or if you died because that would bring upon ill, um, Ill wishing upon oneself, but maybe talking about who would you want to share this information with, who, would you, who, who do you trust, uh, what family members are the people who you share information with when, when you go to the clinic. Um, it's, I think it's also, all, despite all of its potential taboos and the difficulties, I think it's, it's very important to engage participants in talking about these discussions because I don't, it's, it may not be appropriate to just avoid it all com altogether because you're afraid of breaking some cultural taboos, but uh, just ac asking in what context is it appropriate to share with, and remember that not all minorities or families are the same, and uh, even within some cultures you might have very different v views about what people think. And so there, there was a, an approach a couple of years ago that, uh, that was published in the New York Times where uh, the Navajo, and Navajo people who were very afraid of talking about death and end of life discussions in advanced directives uh, were, um, were approached by um, what I thought was a pretty creative way to, of think, talking about this. Um, so social workers were going into communities talking about um, t how important it is to fill out advanced directives, but they were approaching it with a poem. And uh, it was written in both Navajo and English that goes, when that time comes, when my last breath leaves me, I choose to die in peace to meet Shadiyin, the creator. And so there might be different ways of framing how to go about thinking about that. In other cultures, they would talk about when, you're, when you are 120 years old, what would you want your family members to think? Uh, so there's different ways to go about talking about it without actually mentioning death. Uh, so I'm going to skip over some of this because uh, I covered a lot of this already. but. Um, if somebody does not want a research result returned, uh, what do you do? And I think that other people are thinking about that quite actively. But who are the holders of medical knowledge? How does that medical knowledge get, get passed down? Um, and families are quite dynamic, and um, I think that there's, there's just a lot, of, um, a lot of opportunities to explore these questions a lot further. Thank you. Um, I just want to raise the issue about talking about minorities, because if you look around the world, uh, the English-American approach to a lot of these issues is the anomaly <laughs> um, in terms of our emphasis on uh, autonomy and knowledge and information and control. Um, and so I, that's number one. And in Italy, this comes in lots of different ways. A lot of societies feel that if you talk about something, it uh, enhances the possibility that it's going to happen. I think we have something to learn from others. I think we need to be aware of the hegemony that's going on and the forced uh, acculturation that is involved here. I studied um, the issue of communication around a cancer diagnosis in Italy for many years and why it was so resistant. And one of the conclusions I came, is, came to is that it involved, in fact, an accepting the notion that the individual is separate from the parents. That's a, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. I mean, these practices embody a lot of different uh, sort of meaningful cultural issues. And I think we have a lot to learn from others. I think you know, there's sort of a pathology going on here in terms of the obsession with information and knowledge and so on. Mm -hmm. I agree. There's a lot to learn, and I hope, I hope we can continue the conversation later. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Thanks. I just have a, a clarifying question kind of for my education. I mean, separate of the issue of returning results if uh, 
you have a protocol that either you know engages um, a community or an individual from a culture where um, there's an expectation that either an elder or a husband or a father make the decisions. What happens when you're consenting them into the research project and what happens if you have either the person wants to withdraw or the community wants to withdraw or the father or the elder or whoever wants to withdraw? How is that handled today? Um, so when a person wants to withdraw from a research protocol, they usually give uh, notification to their protocol director that they, will, that they wish to withdraw. When it comes to de-identified de biobanks, I think it becomes a little more complicated. Um, but when talking about return, I mean, withdrawing before research results are presented, I, I don't know that there's much um, information out there yet. So I knew I was going to be talking in the afternoon, and I knew I was going to talk right before Dr. Henderson, who has a, a, a nice study. So I, I actually just put together a series of slides that reflect my personal journey with regard to return of results in rare disorders. Um, I should say, though, in, in reference to the other conversation, that our clinical sequencing and exploratory research project is actually quite diverse. 48% 40, of our uh, children in the study are self-defined as Hispanic. About 20% are Spanish-speaking. And we actually just published a paper in genetic medi genomic medicine on our consent process. And in fact, the Hispanic population actually entered at the same or slightly higher rate, actually, uh, the only group for which there was any evidence of being slightly more resistant to um, uh, enrolling were self-declared whites, but the study was too small to really self-identified self as whites, Hispanic whites. Um, and, and I should say that it's in a setting where it's a diverse population and clinic to begin with. And I think that that is probably one of the fundamental issues. And fortunately, in the United States, pretty much all children have health insurance. And so our pediatric clinics, by their nature, are much more diverse than our adult populations. But um, so I'm just going to give a one slide introduction. And then I'm going to give some case examples from rare genetic syndrome research uh, that have somewhat haunted or impacted my own research. And then I'll talk about our clinical trial design for pediatric patients who have a significant risk of demise from uh, just from their diagnosis. I'm sorry, a word got left off there. And then just very briefly, what are some of the unique features of working in pediatrics? So I tried to put this together, and I, I did give, if anyone actually reads the materials, I know I don't. Uh, Amy McGuire, I was just a co-author on this. We actually did a study where we interviewed researchers, predominantly researchers actually involved in big GWAS studies about what they thought about returning results and whether you would ever return results. And I think the title of the paper is something like Context Matters, because in fact, even when interviewing people who were PIs of big GWAS studies, many of their answers when they were being interviewed were, well, in this really big biobank study, I don't think returning results are that appropriate, but I certainly know of smaller rare disease studies I've participated in where it was really important. So this is my little graphic that you know, as the cohort gets bigger, your contact with the researchers gets smaller. And as you deal with rare disorders, they're more likely to be high penetrance, so the mutations mean a lot more to the families. And as I mentioned in the morning session, your contact as a researcher <laughs> with those families goes way up. OK, so I'm just going to give a couple of case examples. So my really my not my first, but my first rare disease study began in 1998 when there were accumulating case reports at a very rare syndrome called Rothman-Thompson syndrome, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide, was associated with a high risk of osteosarcoma, an off, often lethal bone tumor in children. I would say if you look back on that time in the 1990s, the IRBs were very concerned about returning any result that wasn't done in a completely CLIA setting. Uh, and so we developed what we called the Familial Cancer Predisposition Protocol, it's still, still in effect, but it originally said that no results would be given, that the disease gene discovery was our primary goal. So we actually were one of the earliest websites to announce a study of any kind, I think, 
Uh, and we put out a website that's long before Google using, I think, Netscape. Um, and although this syndrome is incredibly rare, over the course of a couple of years, particularly with the hard work of Lisa Wong, who still works on this uh, disorder, we recruited about 30 families. And worldwide should be underlined here. Actually, we only had two families in the state of Texas. These were families from all over the world. And then about a year after we got started, there was a report in Nature Genetics. Uh, Lainey, is Lainey still here? She went to the other room. Lainey's actually a co-author. Lainey Linder, who was in the back of the room, was a co-author of this study. Uh, with uh, identifying RecQL4 mutations in four of six families that Mayo and the Japanese investigators had collected. So we began laboriously, I will underline laboriously, in 1999, sequencing that gene was actually difficult, it's very GC rich, there were all kinds of technical issues long before next gen sequencing, so we started sequencing it in all our families. Okay. This slide is not actually of the patient in question, but this is actually our very first patient. And you probably can't see it very well, but these patients have a very severe skin disorder. They can often have absence of thumbs. Um, and we actually wrote up a paper in 2011, in, uh, sorry, 2001, describing the clinical features of the disorder. Uh, and we began writing the paper on the mutation analysis, and we started presenting it at places. And, we, and so people kind of knew that we had found mutations in about two-thirds of the patients. And those were the group that specifically had the cancer risk. And it was also becoming clear that most families had their own mutation. It's not like cystic fibrosis where there are a few more common ones. Um, and I should just say, this is about expectations. Now, our consent was completely clear that we weren't giving results. Many of the early physicians recruiting patients uh, to us were geneticists who were pretty sophisticated about research. And we made it clear to them that we weren't disclosing results. But we were getting all kinds of emails and phone calls from people saying, where's my result? So I do think no matter what you say, people and their physicians think they're going to get results. But at that time, we just kept declining. And we would tell people, don't you remember the consent said that? Uh, and people would say to me, well, you don't really mean that, right? You're going to tell me by phone. And at that time, it was not unusual to have studies where people would call you and tell you the results, but they wouldn't put it in a letter. Okay. So that's the scene. OK, so we get an is email from Israel. It's probably now about 2003. Subject, I won't give the study number because the study numbers are in the paper, had died of osteosarcoma. The parents of the child were early in pregnancy, and they wanted prenatal counseling, or they had had prenatal counseling, and they knew that they had a 25% risk of having another affected child. There was a clinical lab in, in Israel that was willing to confirm anything we had found but they needed to know our results. So what would you do? Come on. What would you do? How sure were you of your results? As you can probably tell, I'm a relatively confident person. Um, uh, I, think we, I think we thought we knew the results. For this family, we knew the results. The only way, that's the key point down below. There was a clinical lab willing to do it. They had, no one was offering sequencing of this gene. No one could just set it up by themselves at that time, certainly not within the context of this pregnancy. So the lab needed to know what we knew in order to look at the parents. The child had died. There was no other sample from the child. So there's actually no way to do it by CLIA. Just, I mean, people talk about, well, you could just do it by CLIA. Child had died. Only sample from this child is in my research laboratory, which was not CLIA in any way, you know, confirmed. But could you do it for them outside of the research and provide it to them? No, because I'm not a CLIA lab. So. I mean, I think, you know, one can kind of argue around this, but the key is they actually had to know what we knew. So I'll tell you what we did. Uh, we had identified two subjects in, two mutations in the subject. There was no other clinical specimen. And I'm sorry, I forgot I said that. There's no lab in the world that offers it. So what we actually did was we requested a waiver from the Baylor IRB uh, to provide the physician and the lab in Israel the results, despite the fact that they had signed a consent and a protocol that said we wouldn't. The waiver was actually rapidly granted, and we did provide the information to the family and the clinicians in Israel. Uh, the labs in Israel actually confirmed our findings. They confirmed which of the parents had which mutation. And in fact, that fetus was found to have inherited both mutations. 
I don't actually know if the family decided to terminate or not. Um, but I will say that event caused us to modify our consent to provide return of results if found to be clinically important. Yes, Michelle. Did you go back to the parents in the meantime and, and to get their consent to do what you did? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, well, the parents had made it clear. I mean, it's a good question. I, I don't know what documentation. They certainly had contacted us. Their physician had contacted us that they had arranged for a lab to confirm it. The parents had certainly made it clear they were the ones driving that they wanted this. But relative to the cultural issue, prenatal genetic testing is very common in Israel uh, among the, um, the non-ultra-Orthodox. Uh, uh, and termination is available in Israel. And so I think within the context of the Israeli society, if you could know whether you had a child affected with a severe recessive disorder, of course, the Tay-Sachs history, um, that was certainly culturally within what they wanted to do. So we actually did change our consent. So, um, and we do, and now for 10 years, uh, we tell people that if we find something we think to be clinically important and it meets peer review, we will return it. We will say it's a research result. We will tell you it should be CLIA certified. As far as I'm aware, we are probably breaking the law with regard to CLIA. Um, and our IRB has allowed us to do that. Other IRBs don't. So case two, it's very brief. Uh, this is uh, two boys who both developed uh, uh, liver tumors. Liver tumors are extremely rare just in general, and so having two boys with uh, lethal liver tumors is highly likely to be genetic. While the second child was alive, all known tumor syndromes were tested and were clinically negative. And the family actually entered a research protocol. And it got very complicated. The kid entered at Baylor. The parents entered at MD Anderson or vice versa. I forget which. Um, at the advent of whole exome and genome sequencing where we thought, oh, we're going to solve this quickly. And um, we still have found no answer. And I just would say this is a mother who contacts me religiously at least every six months saying, have we figured, figured it out? She's afraid to have additional children. What's the risk to her daughters? But she often will also ask me about, well, did we find this common gene or that common gene? And I'll have to try to explain that we don't really report that, and it's probably not related to their tumor. But it's just to say that some families really want results. Okay. So very briefly, um, the study we're doing now is in a very different context. These are children, and it's already been mentioned that Caesar's an NHI, NH, NHGRI, NCI funded endeavor. Will Parsons is my co-PI. And in this case, it's completely different. We're doing CLIA exome sequencing, newly diagnosed childhood cancer patients. They're not necessarily uh, at high genetic risk, unlike my other study. And we're doing both blood and tumor and we're returning both to the patients, and it is in the electronic medical record. Uh, they're all children. We estimated that about 30% of them would have a tumor that would relapse within two years, and for many of these children, there is not curative uh, treatment available. Um, and the turnaround time is about 15 weeks. So I'm going to skip a lot about the timing, but it's just to say that although we thought that we'd be able to return most of the results before children progress, there are a number of things that can delay it, um, including just the parent's ability to come in and consent, the parent's ability to come in and disclose. So um, just because of time, I just want to say what we initially planned was that for the vast majority of the kids, we would give the result before the child died, um, and hopefully it would be of use to make decisions about recurrence. Um, and we thought that if the child had died, we'd contact the parent through the primary oncologist and meet with them. So here are just a couple of examples. The first is a child who had adrenal cortical cancer, so actually a high likelihood of being genetic. There was a P53 mutation found in the germline. The results came back about a month after the child died. Uh, it, we waited for several months. We contacted the family. I was able to actually meet with this family. I went out to a community hospital to do it. I had the oncologist with me, and I would just echo that I think for many of these post-death uh, or uh, post-mortem discussions, often the family wants to know more about what happened at the time of death, so it's really good to have the treating doctor there. Uh, but we have had extensive interaction with this family. They have had testing of other family members. 
The second case is a child who had Wilms tumor. In this case, the, result, the child actually presented with very advanced disease, and the results were only available about two months afterwards. There was nothing really actionable that we found, and it took almost a year before the family was ready to come in. Uh, we, again, they were able to come back to the clinic. That's another issue. People often don't want to come back to the hospital. For many of these parents, the children's hospital, they just walk in the door and start to cry. Um, and again, much of the discussion was not about the genetic results, but about what happened in the care of the child. This patient, I think, is a particularly informative one. This is a three-year-old, very unusual to have malignant melanoma. There was a mutation found in the tumor, but actually they already knew that from other testing. There was nothing in the germline. The father was actually a physician. And so he said he didn't want to come in, but he wanted to talk on the phone. We set up the conference about a month after death, which was probably too soon, but he had agreed to it. He got on the phone call, and about two minutes into the phone call just said, I am not ready for this, and just said, please just send me the counseling letter. I can't really talk about it. So again, I think we haven't talked much in this conference about timing, but I think the, certainly for parents of a child who have died, it can be many, many months before they're willing to talk about any event related to their children's care. And then we've had a variety of other uh, cases where there's been some complexity. One of the most common one is in patients with cancer, and I think this is almost my last slide. In patients with cancer, they often will transfer care to be on another clinical trial, and they don't necessarily want to come back to your institution. Um, or of course, there can be concerns about the parents themselves. So now we actually, again, still try to do this through the primary oncologist, but if we're unable to disclose, schedule the disclosure, the results are in the electronic medical record. I hate that every program corrects EHR um, and to her, and then we notify them by mail. So last slide, context really marries. The desire of parents to get results is highly variable. So my experience has been in rare genetic conditions where they really know it's genetic and they know they're at risk to have more children with the disorder, they really want to know. In the case of just cancer patients, there are lots of other issues that get in the way, but you certainly have to plan for it in any of these protocols. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, having the treating physician involved is very important. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a study that is being conducted by our, we have a center that's uh, one of the centers of excellence in LC research. It's, there's the, the grant number. Um, and um, Deb, Deborah Skinner is uh, our, the associate director of the center, medical anthropologist, my close colleague, had a lot to do with some of the discussions about family. This was an interesting opportunity for me because I thought when Susan first asked me, this is, my, my, my studies are relevant to the topic of this conference. Why are you inviting me? You must not understand what we're doing. Well, actually, I was wrong, so let me explain why. So this is, GeneScreen is um, a new project um, to, uh, out there. The only similar thing that's happening uh, in the world might be, perhaps be, you know, a, a, a corollary is direct to consumer marketing. So it's preventive screening and so-called healthy adults or asymptomatic adults. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the background and rationale for gene screen, implementing the pilot, and then um, as the slides progress, um, where, it's, where the comments are relevant to the conference, I've bolded them. Um, and again, as I said, I, I began to see not only have we forgotten things we really needed to do, but in fact, they're really profoundly important for our study. So the background um, is Jonathan Berg, who some of you uh, know quite well, is a geneticist at UNC and colleagues, proposed a system of binning of sequencing results, which was my first introduction, although I know the field's not first introduction to the idea of medically actionable um, uh, findings that uh, appeared in the CSER studies and other sequencing studies uh, and raised this whole question about what to do about something that's incidental in a diagnostic uh, in, in endeavor that might have meaning for the, um, for the person being sequenced. Um, and um, our CSER study, which is called NC Genes, clever. Most of our studies are called NC something. NC Nexus is our kid study. Um, and it employs um, whole exome sequencing for diagnostic purposes, and it uses this binning system to separate out 
medically actionable from non-actionable. So gene screen, and uh, Jonathan, uh, as well as Jim Evans and others who are part of the NC gene study are also part of our center, does target a very different population. It's um, trying to mimic a, a public health program uh, that would screen um, asymptomatic adults for rare medically actionable variants, so-called BIN1. And to remind you, um, screening is a process of identifying apparently healthy people who may be at increased risk of a disease or condition. When it's done right, um, and when, uh, well, there's a lot of uh, caveats about screening since a lot of uh, people focus now on harms of screening, but it can save lives and improve health outcomes but it can also lead to harms from misdiagnosis, overtreatment, and anxiety. You have to find people at a time when it would have made a difference um, in, in their health outcome. Um, and Gene Screen has a panel. Now, it, we are, have been extremely selective. We have a really high bar. It's, we do not include all of the BIN1 genes in, in our uh, CSER study. We do not include all of the ACMG56. For those of you in the know, that's not a soup. Um, but we have 17 genes associated with 11 serious conditions. And we selected them. We started, we were very fortunate to have the CSER study at UNC two years ahead of our desire to pick a very selected uh, panel. And out of 161 uh, medically actionable genes for NC genes, we picked 17. And we had the metric, which I list there. It's, it's, these, this, it, it's sort of semi-quantitative because, frankly, there's a lot of subjectivity as we see. In fact, there's, uh, our medical anthropologist is studying the production of the result uh, because there's a lot of uh, subjectivity. But it's severity and likelihood of clinical uh, outcomes, efficacy and burden of interventions, um, the strength of the knowledge base of, of those things, and then other conditions kind of bled in, cost, prevalence, ability to detect the pathogenic variants, and so on. So, so we have this list. Um, the list um, includes things that you might recognize, certainly BRCA1, oh, and BRCA1, that's great, BRCA1 and 2, um, uh, four genes associated with Lynch syndrome, or defining Lynch syndrome, which, is, which puts people at risk for colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, and some others. Um, Romano Ward syndrome, which is a cardiac problem of sort of sudden death. Um, long QT syndrome, it's uh, also called. And a bunch of others, the last one is something that um, has to do with a, re a reaction to anesthesia. And so if you never have surgery and you never get that kind of anesthesia, you would never know that you would potentially die. So why gene screen now? What's the rationale for doing this kind of thing now? Um, well, we have the technological capability. Um, it's not as expensive. In fact, every year that we've delayed actually launching this, it's gotten cheaper for us, which is kind of wonderful because I'm the PI. Um, we have the binning approach, so we, have, we can take advantage of um, the CSER study. There is a large uncontrolled experiment already existing in, uh, in the world, particularly in the States, and it, um, which is, uh, in my view, really problematic, um, and it makes a systematic assessment of offering um, these kinds of results to people all the more pressing, actually urgent. We argued in our grant this is an urgent, urgent public health need, and I actually think that was not hyperbolic. Um, and, okay, now we screen newborns, don't we? Why, why shouldn't we screen adults? Isn't this a, a logical extension of the presumed benefit of uh, newborn screening? Um, this is the title of an article that Jim Evans and others wrote. Well, but actually newborn screening is not a perfect analogy. We, we talked about this a, a little bit at lunch with Michelle and others. Um, but it's kind, of, it's kind of like that, so we use it as a bit of a, just a frame. But for adults, actionability has very different time frame, and I think that's very important. I mean, frankly, unless you're going to have that surgery for which you have that gene that would make you have this hypothermic reaction if you happen to get that anesthesia, it's not really, none of the rest of it is life or death right that moment. Um, I, and I think most important from my view, well, and is, um, and this goes along with the idea that um, newborn screening 
usually is willing to accept a certain degree of false positive results because there are further confirmatory tests you can do. In our case, that actually doesn't turn out to be true. Um, and so it's a very big danger to launch this um, in the face of really not having systematic evidence that in a population, screening would be something that would have more benefits than harms. In the packet, um, I sent uh, an article that um, the lead author is Anya Prince, who's our postdoc, and it's um, and it really does take a look at what you might, what we really need to do this on to do this on a population level in terms of evidence, and it's highly problematic. And I won't go into that now for time, but. Um, there, there's just an awful lot of evidence that we don't have because most of the evidence about using any of these tests comes from affected individuals and their families. So we don't know about, for example, prevalence or penetrance in the general population. Um, so, and there's daunting logistics of population screening anyway. Um, Mary Claire King, I don't know how many of you uh, saw her recent call to screen all women in the United States for, for BRCA1 and 2, which was immediately opposed by the National Society of Genetic Counselors uh, up for many reasons, but one of which is really who is going to work on that. Um, so there's a lot of issues. That, so what, what we argue is you really need to very carefully, slowly ramp up a, um, a, um, a study that would look at feasibility, acceptability, logistics, um, and a lot of the ethics involved with trying to do population screening for uh, among asymptomatic people for these for this, these very 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 actionable mutations, so that's what gene screen is. Um, our our plan is to recruit a thousand people. Um, participants are going to be asked for the name of a family member or designated person to receive the results. If they're not able, there's an, a big addition for us. I mean, well, we, we do it in NC genes, but nevertheless, that's a really important thing to say. Now, these are really rare. We have a panel of 17 genes. Only about 2%, we expect only about 2% to have positive, true positive results. That's, that's tiny. That's really not enough. But again, I'm arguing that to do this really carefully, you can't take 100,000 people and just do it. I think you've really, really got to consider all of the sort of ethical um, and logistical implications. Now, very quickly. Why would people join this? I should have just had a blank there, and you could, I, if we had a lot of time, you could tell me if you would join or not. People might be early adopters. They might find the idea of preventive genomic screening, screening generally appealing. They may have an interest in one of the questions. There may actually be a family history, despite our desire to recruit people who don't have family histories. And they may value information for them and their children. We have a community advisory board who said that. We, we are recruiting people in um, primary care practices so that we know that they do have access to primary care for the rare people who will find, who will have a positive result. But why would people decline? Um, for reasons that many of us who have done research in this field for years and years would be able to make up without, in fact, I did make this up because we haven't started yet. But I think these are reasonable reasons people would decline. Um, I've done a lot of work on why people join or don't join biobanks. Um, anyway, um, concern about privacy, concern about genetic discrimination that's not covered by GINA, not, not believing GINA will really help them anyway. Fearful of some of the conditions on the panel, Worried, worry about the accuracy of the test, worry about finding a condition in the family that family members may not welcome. Um, now, we're collecting a lot of information about acceptability and feasibility as we roll this out very slowly. We're, we're collecting information from people who think about joining and join, and think about joining and decline. Um, and so we are going to find out about why people want to participate, what they're worried about, what they're excited about, what they understand about the conditions on the panel, um, and what they understand about what a true positive result means and what a not positive result means. We, none of our negative results will be clear confirmed. They are, uh, we accept that we're going to have some false negatives. That's just the balance. Be try, trying to get as many true positives as you can. Um, and so we have an opportunity to re explore something that I think is very important and maybe hasn't been discussed enough uh, today, which is 
the so-called negative result. Um, so 98% will screen not positive. So, and if someone has a family history of one of our conditions, what are they gonna think about that? Are they gonna believe it? What will they tell family members? Will they, in fact, um, tell their physician, even though it's not uh, um, a confirmed clinical result? And what if they haven't bothered to go back on our website to collect that result? What do we, do we have an obligation to them that's different than to the ones, the few that get positive results? Um, and among the ones who screen positive, our current plan is to return CLIA certified positive results to participants and primary care providers in the practices that, where we recruit. Um, in the case of incapacity or death, we would then return to the designated person if there is, if there is one. Um, and that's, those are, that's areas that we need to explore and we need to really think about how to do this well. I'm very happy to have had a lot of these issues covered already and to see what different in a really different population of people who are in extremis around the illness of a child, how they might respond to wanting positive results um, compared to some of the other things that were talked about with regard to culture, um, demographic diversity, et cetera. So I know this is really complicated. Um, we will offer to discuss whether and how to inform family members. The, or informing family members is going to be something that the participant, because this is a research study, that it's going to be their choice. Um, and, we'll, and we, as a research study, are moving into a clinical setting by offering te a testing plan for relatives who may be at risk to make that offer. Now, there's some controversies around who to include and for what tests. Is there going to be a duty to warn felt? I mean, this conference alerted me to this question that some of our clinicians may feel a stronger duty to warn, although I take seriously the recommendations that are being put forward to, that this is a may and a, this is not really a duty, at least not in this context. Um, another thing that's really important to us is the issue about <laughs> this misperception that these are healthy participants, that just because they're asymptomatic for well, we can't even guarantee that they don't have breast cancer, they don't have colon cancer, they don't have heart arrhythmias. We, but we're recruiting them as so-called healthy participants, and they, that's re ridiculous. But this might be a completely unanticipated, just absolutely just brick dropped on, on their heads, and that may be very, very distressing. That would be, in fact, quite a, quite a lot of harm. Um, but um, they may... Um, but I think some, this again, just a couple more slides, and this is sort of the interesting part, I think, and that is that information that they get really may cause them to reinterpret um, or redefine their health, and I think a lot of anthropologists have documented these kinds of processes, um, and health of family members, health of ancestors, health of distant relatives in different ways. And in addition, and most of you um, understand this, they become the bearer of the gene for the family whether it exists in other places, they're the ones who are identified as having it now, and then the gatekeeper of positive results. So this moral decision-making process ensues, and this is where I think, you know, many people who want to talk more about this, this is exactly what they're talking about. When they talk about getting into the context of the family, that, moral, that there's a moral calculus regarding who should be informed. And that communication is certainly affected by the history of family dynamics. When, when, and this is a quote from Monica Comrade that I think is really quite lovely. When a patient or parent first learns of a genetic diagnosis, they become involved in a genealogical ethics. So I love that phrase. Uh, deciding who in the extended family to tell, what information to reveal, when to tell, and who should do the telling. And patterns of disclosure or non-disclosure can have consequences, certainly for relatives' health, reproductive decisions, and well-being. These are well known by you. Um, this is the last slide. So what are the participant gatekeepers' challenges in this particular study, this context, public health screening, as it were? And this is where we really need to understand the harms and benefits, like in the context of these people and their families. So will they understand the condition, the risk information, follow-up testing well enough? Will they be able to pass it on accurately so families can make good choices? And what if some family are not told but should be? And what are some of the relationship harms for the participant and the family 
that might result. Um, and so despite the fact that this sounds really complicated and very individual, in fact, based in families, we still need to make a really big effort to assess how disclosure occurs and its, how its impacts could be part of a harms benefit assessment. That's it. Thank you very much. There's the acknowledgement. So, Gail, I have a question for you. First of all, thank you all. Those were great presentations. So, um, it's there Michelle in the back. Um, so, are you planning to ask your participants how they plan to change their behavior based on the information? And I'll explain why I'm asking. So, my mother died from colon cancer, and I have to undergo periodic colonoscopies. So, when I saw your example, my first thought was, oh, if I did that, I, would, I wonder if I would have to have them as frequently. And so, I, I think that's important to think about, sort of, both for your positive and for your negative results. So, were you, were you tested? No, I, no. no. So, um, okay. she never underwent any, any genetic testing, and so I just get my periodic that's based on family history. So, so you raise, that's a really interesting question. First, yes, we definitely are going to follow um, all the positives since there are so few in this part of the study and a set of negatives, but, um, and to find out what they do with the information and how they, how their act, well, who they tell, how their behaviors change. But the, with the negatives, one of the most important things from my point of view is that these are so rare um, that the lifetime risk of, for example, colorectal cancer, if you do, if you don't have Lynch syndrome, that doesn't change your lifetime risk. Your lifetime risk because your mother had colorectal cancer is, you know, whether she, now if she, sorry, you can see, all right, I'm falling apart because I'm not a geneticist, but. All it would do is make you get screened more, not less. Right, right. right. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> but, but we're really worried that people will interpret not having the positive result for the very, very rare conditions as somehow making them, and then maybe they will tell their relatives that they, oh, you know, we're not going to get colorectal cancer. I mean, that's a big potential harm. That, that was my point, not what the implications were for me personally. But there there is some data on that from the early days of Lynch syndrome and BRCA1 and 2. So we did a study where we followed the negatives among Ashkenazi Jewish individuals for five years and showed that the negatives did not change their mammography behavior because that was actually one of the IRB's concerns. Oh. Um, wow. wow, I didn't know you did that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, there was a lot of research in the 90s done on BRCA1 and 2 that are being kind of repeated now with exomes. <laughs> to a certain extent. Hello, thank you. It's a great conference. Um, I'm from the University of Minnesota a, a Genomics Core Facility, so this is somewhat of a, you know, not directly related to this afternoon's one, topics, but somewhat related to Sharon, what you do, because when researchers send their sequences and samples to run those, we are the ones who run them. Right. Even though we are not doing the deep statistical analysis for the, of their data, but we do run through preliminary analysis and dump the data. Now, we can see some stuff. What have you, anybody addressed? What do we do as a core facility? Because we are not the researcher, we are just the processors. Do we tell the researcher, oh, by the way, even though you are, your topic of analysis does not really cover this, but we found this? What's the obligation to yeah, I'm sorry that those El facilities? I'm, I'm sorry that Ellen lost. I mean, this has been the whole issue about hunting versus looking. And, you know, I, I, I think this is, I think the, even though my good friends wrote the ACMG guidelines, I think that they really didn't take into account. So, for example, in my studies, we may only be interested in the child. So we subtract the parents. I never actually look at the parents, right? There's nothing about my research design that would actually have me look at the parents. But a core facility might notice that, well, actually, a parent has a very important mutation. The kid just didn't inherit it. So in my analysis, I would never see it. And, and I don't think that's been addressed. I think most people would tell you that it's not in your purview to look. Um, but I don't know that we've got clear guidance. I don't know what other people would feel about that. Um, but we all parse the data differently, and we're really looking for specific things. Um, and so we often don't, we really don't look 
And if someone brought it to my attention, then I guess with the current ACMG guidelines, I'd probably feel like I'd have to disclose it. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't bring it to someone's attention. I think it's probably something that your core facility needs to think about. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Lee. I'm at the University of Minnesota Med School on the Duluth campus. Uh, so my question is for Dr. Garrison. Uh, thanks for sharing your culture. I'm also Navajo, so yeah. Um, so I know you brought up the idea of taboos and being a native researcher, uh, working with native communities, how do you think those taboos sort of not so much limit natives into research because of these taboos? Um, but how would you think having more of these native scientists in the field working with the communities would be of importance? Or what, do you, what are your views on that? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, I think, well, it's, it's sort of an understudied area. There's not a whole lot of um, um, empirical research in this area. But we do know that a lot of, um, that, well, we, we know that the um, rates of participation of Native, Native Americans and other um, minorities is very low. I mean, we, we saw the slide earlier of 90% uh, of uh, research participants are from white or European uh, descent backgrounds. Um, and there's probably a lot of different reasons for that. Some of them are explored a little bit in the papers um, that were presented in the literature review that uh, Dr. Um, or that, that Dr. Breikhoff mentioned earlier. Um, but I think by increasing the number of uh, Native American per researchers and physicians, um, that really helps to break down some of the cultural taboos or, or really helping to share what these um, cultural taboos are and being sort of a gatekeeper or a liaison between uh, uh, non-Native physicians and researchers with the community. Because I think a lot of people just don't really know what these concerns are, um, so they don't know to address them. And so I think having more people like you um, be that voice uh, to share what these cultural issues are can help to break down some of those taboos and perhaps um, increase the, the um, rate of participation. I would just comment that the tab that, that taboo that you particularly mentioned, that if you mention it, it increases the likelihood, I think is, it, it's actually a very common Ashkenazi Mm -hmm. taboo, this whole thing about not buying the baby presents yeah. until it was absolutely right. carried out by the American Jewish community probably until the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. So I, that's an incredibly pervasive taboo. It's very interesting that we don't, people don't write about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I wanted to say also as somebody who's apparently pretty white, that, um, that there, there is great heterogeneity and, and we, one of the things we've done with our study, I mean among whites, that, and among others, that, so what I think one thing that we can do is listen to stories from other cultures and not fetishize them, yes, and I'm not even yeah. remotely suggesting you are, but say, whoa, that, that actually sounds somewhat familiar. That sounds like, wait, these are kind of human responses to death, that we don't want to make assumptions from a biomedical, clinical ethics sort of perspective, that, that the participants are, they just need to be informed, they need to be educated, and so on. So, I mean, one thing we've done, and I'm really happy about it, is to have a, a, a community advisory board representing really broad, different constituencies of the people that we're trying to recruit, and we really, you know, talk to them about, you know, what they would think, what they, I mean, that those kind of things are very helpful. But even imagining from the kinds of things that you talked about, imagining how we could actually apply that to whites, too. I think it's really important. Right. And, and you know, I don't, I don't want to um, say that these concerns or um, issues are only in minority populations. A lot of uh, white populations also feel the same way about some of these things, but not about others. Yeah, so the issue is to ask. I, I was going to ask you if you wouldn't mind that an issue that's come up in my own research is that the Navajo Nation, for example, may make a determination about genetics research that may be different than individuals. Mm -hmm. And how is that, has that kind of influenced any of the work you're doing or? 
Yes, so uh, tribal sovereignty um, really adds another layer of complexity when dealing with uh, research, and including genetic research studies. Uh, the Navajo Nation and several other nations have either, well, the Navajo Nation has a moratorium on re genetic right. research studies, and other tribal nations also have restrictions of various sorts. Um, but other tribes really do embrace research. Um, it's unclear um, when, I mean, there's, Nobody has really challenged what the um, what would happen if an individual from a tribal nation that has a moratorium would do if they went out and um, participated in research. No, that hasn't been challenged, and so there's it no hasn't. there's no uh, guidance or um, no case law around that. But it's sort of you know you want to be a good citizen or not. Thank so you. thank you for coming to our session.